Hi, how are you? <clears throat> Hi, Gilbert. Hi, Tisha. Hi, Katrina. <clears throat> how are you? How are you today? Good, good. I'm good. I'm doing good. Thanks. Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear. Oh, okay. I can hear you. Yeah. Oh, good. How about no. me? Can you hear me? Yeah, now I can hear you. I don't, it was probably on my side. I'm, I'm, yeah. Uh, hi, Jamie. Hi, Gilbert. Please meet um, our guest speaker, um, Dr. Manu Buri. Hi, Gilbert. Hi, Jamie. Very, very good evening to you both. I'm very excited for this talk. I was just reading your paper. How are you both? Uh, I'm doing well, thanks. How are you? Excellent. I am very well, thank you. Get ready for some questions. I have seven or eight or nine or ten. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. <laughs> are you having a good day so far? Yeah, it's been good, like the usual stuff, talking to students, getting things done, meetings and stuff, the usual, yeah. Is good. Hey, I've been a student. I've never got things done as a student. <laughs> well, in the sense, it's in a, in my case, it's helping students to get their things done. So yeah, okay, yeah. So you you you're the you're the guided hand, yeah. Yeah, I'm the mentor yes. kind of. So that's excellent. Right, we're just setting things up here. Give me one moment, please. Right, we're still got a few minutes before we get started so feel free do you have any questions for the up and coming talk since we've got a few minutes uh, before we get started doctors oh uh, not really because katarina briefed us yesterday how it's gonna roll out so good yeah fantastic um you're in the uk as well aren't you both of yeah. you Nope. Oh, you're not uh, in the UK? Nope, we're based in Finland. Oh, you're in Finland. I'm, I'm in the UK. That's probably why our time zones are like closer than whenever I have to participate in the American ones. All right. I quite frequently have Hi, to be Jonas. awake at all sorts of Hello. times in the morning. Okay. How are you doing there, Katerina? Good, good. Thank you. How are you? How are you? Thank you for coming, Jonas. Um, yeah, I hope your days went well. I know for you it's already pretty late. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I had to already quickly have dinner with my daughter and set up a different headphone system for her to watch YouTube while I have my own thing over here. <laughs> so we have a media going on. Yeah, the how old is your daughter? They love you, those YouTube videos, right? My my kids the same. <laughs> yeah, but some of the videos have some sort of zombie survival hack, so <laughs> I don't know how useful they are. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Or do they also watch um, other kids play video games? <laughs> That's what my kids do. <laughs> <laughs> no, just some sort of uh, like all kinds of like hacks of how to cook something in the kitchen or how to make colors out of skittles or all those kind of things. Oh well, that's pretty good. That's, that's yeah, some some of them are good. Yeah. Some of them are zombie survival that <laughs> are not as useful as the others, but it's a variety. Hi, Victoria. Hi, Sasi Rahim. Meet our guest speakers, Jonas and um, uh, Sisha. Am I saying your name right now or uh, did I say it wrong again? <laughs> uh, it, it, it's fine. It's fine. You got it right. Yeah. 
Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Yeah, so Victoria is in, in the West Coast. So for her, it's still morning. For you, you guys, it's <laughs> yeah. evening. <laughs> yes. Uh oh, good day. <laughs> Good afternoon. <laughs> what what will be what will we invent uh, for for our situation? Good day doesn't work. Good morning. How about just good something? I don't know. <laughs> good everything. Nice to see you. <laughs> yes. Exactly. What about what about what about good science? <laughs> right. <laughs> I'll have to work on that one. So, um, yeah, we'll start in around three minutes. Hi, Dr. Shah, how are you today? Hi, everyone. Hi. Hello. Hi, Dr. Shaw. Hi, Sissy, Reen. Hi, Jamie. How do I see everyone who's here? I see like six people on my screen. Where do I find the others? Is there some sort of view? Can you... Uh, I'm not sure. Are you on a computer or? No, on my phone. IOS. Okay, yeah, can you, are you able to scroll? So move your screen up. And ah, then okay, have... others in room, then I can see four more people. Right. Yeah. Glad you asked. Because you were like saying hello to people who were coming and I didn't see anyone. So makes Yeah, sense. we're also mysterious. How do I pronounce your name, doctor? I'm sorry, it came late. Oh, so which one are you asking? Oh, we have a group here. Wonderful. Sesha? Yes, that's right. All that's right. Me. Nice to meet you. And Yunus? Nice to meet you. Thank you. Yes, perfect. Okay. How exciting. Okay, I think we can slowly start and then um, and then we can always um, when when more people will arrive. Um, well, we'll start with the interview, so um, that's perfect. So, um, welcome everyone to the Science Society. Thank you so much for coming, and um, a special thanks to our guest speakers here, uh, Dr. Sisha um, Manuguri and um, Dr. Um, Jonas Risi. And let me give you, let me introduce you um, a little bit to the audience. Um, so, um, yeah, they have, you know, some information where you currently are. So, Dr. Um, Jonas uh, Risi, he is um, in the Department of Neuroscience and Biomedical, Engin uh, he, um, Biomedical Engineering. Um, he is, um, he has worked his whole, whole life um, working towards, uh, he's interested in working towards having an, a quite international career. And um, yeah, his passion is to be part of great discoveries and stories. And um, yeah, he, he's, um, his dream is to work ma with materials also that will be used to go to outer space. So he's at the Alto University. Um, but, um, he has a PhD in bioengineering and biomedical um, engineering. Um, and um, yeah, it's a pleasure to have you here. 
And thank, thanks for the introduction. <laughs> yes, thank you. And um, Dr. Uh, Sisha um, Manuguri, um, he's a postdoctoral researcher. Um, and um, he um, is looking, it's very solution driven and he has experience in designing and executing complex research projects in the field of material sciences. Um, he um, he um, loves working in cross-functional teams uh, where you have a very diverse um, back teams of backgrounds. Um, and he is also at the Alto University full time. Um, and um, yeah, thank you so much. And he also has a quite international background. He also uh, did, was at the Auckland University and New Zealand uh, before and at the Royal Institute of Technology. Um, so welcome to both of you and uh, Victoria will do a short interview so that we will learn a little bit more about you in a more interactive way. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much for the introduction, Katerina. So um, thank you, Katerina, for those, the, um, the introduction. I would like to ask you both um, two questions, but we'll start with this question to to give our audience a bit of background information and to carry us into hearing about your research with that background. My question is, if you can think about a time in your life that you noticed that you felt a particular affinity for science. And, and that could be um, somebody that you met in your life um, when you were a child or somewhere during the time of your schooling that, that you really felt connected to science, that this was, that science was a place for you. So um, that's my question. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Yes, Sesha, you're on Can my, I... you come first. So let's start with you. Yes, go for it. Okay. Uh, so, well, for me, uh, interest in science or passion in science came very uh, late in the late in my career during my PhD. Uh, the reason I got into science was uh, like I started researching when I was in my second uh, bachelor's. But the reason being, uh, I was from a small town in India and I went to this big university, so I had a lot of inhibitions. So science was a way to for me to overcome my inhibitions. It was not really a passion per se initially, but uh, but during my master's, it was the environment in Sweden that kind of uh, brought out the scientist in me, the freedom that I got to explore my ideas in the lab and the people around that I spoke to, especially my uh, supervisor or boss at that time, uh, Professor Olaf Ramstrom, he was a kind and a very uh, smart human being. So he uh, motivated me and mentored me uh, quite uh, quite well during my master's period. That was the initiation for me into serious science. Into the PhD, uh, it, was, uh, it was mostly in my final years of my PhD that I started uh, uh, developing a concrete understanding of what I wanted to do in future regarding my scientific career. But uh, to be honest, uh, for me, science is not, for me, I like problem solving. It could be anything related to science or non-science stuff. I just like to uh, bring in different fields of science or technology or history or music just to understand complex uh, theories or complex problems. So it could be anything, not only science. Science is just a tool for me to understand these uh, complex issues pertaining to human beings or animals or it could be anything. So that, That's my story. I hope I've answered your question. <laughs> You have, and and I I appreciate that that you made the answer truthful to you. You know the sincerity of that that it's the understanding of complex issues 
and not necessarily science related. Um, yeah. You know, it is, yeah, thank you so much. It is personal to you. And uh, Eunice, can you please share yeah. that? Okay, Shesha's answer was quite, uh, quite profound. So uh, let me, let me try to <laughs> try to get something in a similar sense. I guess for me is that um, I love learning. My goal in life is to learn, but it doesn't have to be science. I also, I love languages because in languages you're constantly learning. You are never, never done. Like, you know, I nowadays use English as basically my first language, but that's not how I grew up. And then I also speak Finnish and Swedish and French and hopefully add another language later in life. But in that one, but to come science, I need to, I, I don't know now why, but in high school, I took all the possible science courses, math and physics and chemistry, whatever was available. And after that, I went to do applied physics degree in, uh, in Adelaide, in Australia, in University of South Australia. And I think I need to give shout out to that university because they're studying physics. It gave me this uh, opportunity to do learn through failure. Like I think best way to learn is through failure and we won't well, people admit it or not, we fail constantly. And in the, in physics, you were allowed to fail. Things didn't have to work out. You just need to write a report about it of what happened and what, for example, if nothing worked out, what went wrong. So I guess, and in the same, and in the same university, I got my first research internship and my first, first author paper. And that environment was so, I don't know, welcoming and everyone was helpful. And I was to try things and things happened to work out during that research internship that I got my first paper. So at that point I thought, okay, maybe I can do this research thing. But, but for me, I'm also, also at the point that like Cesar said, I love problem solving. So I'm also at the point that I don't necessarily need to do science tomorrow in my life to be okay. As long as I'm able to, I guess, solve problems. Like we organized a scientific conference during my PhD and I loved organizing that one because that whole thing, we had no idea what we we're doing. And the whole thing was just problem solving from start to finish. So hopefully that also is a profound answer. Thank you. That's, um, we didn't, we, I guess I didn't uh, factor in the idea that with two answers, then they're pushing to uh, yeah, um, outdo the profoundity, <laughs> profundity of the other, <laughs> which is, no, I'm joking. That's, that's amazing. And, and maybe I'm, it's, it's actually prompting me to consider, maybe I need to shift the nature of my question because I, I'm hearing your that you're highlighting the the aspect of problem solving without without um, narrowing that problem solving down into any area of of um, yeah any area at all which is which is somewhat artificial because life you know everything is involved in in other things and we learn that more and more the interrelatedness of things so um, thank you both of you for bringing that up and and being so sincere in your response then. My follow-up question for both of you again is where can you lead us um, to a path that, that brings you here to your current research from, from where we left off in maybe in your PhD program, um, you know, or um, Sesha or Jonas, where you were mentioning uh, in publishing your first paper, but how, do, how did you find yourself in doing the work that you're doing today? And we'll start with Sesha again, thank you. Cesar, Cesar can start, but I can guess that Cesar's answer will somehow cover my answer as well, but I'll, I'll continue after Cesar. Uh, all right. Uh, thanks, Jonas. Uh, so uh, this was uh, uh, after my PhD, um, I moved to Finland for a postdoc. So it was a three-year postdoc uh, opportunity. Uh, so for the first, in the first meeting that I had with my boss, he said, look, I don't have anything specific for you to work on i have certain topics that 
uh, I can propose and it's your, up to you. So for me, uh, my natural inclination is bringing together uh, multiple different things into one single system. So I like working at the interfaces. Like if you bring, like, let's say a composite material, you got to put three or four things together to make to make a function out of it. That's always my uh, passion and inclination. Uh, it, always been my passion and inclination since my PhD days. So we started working on it and our lab works on DNA based material so okay let's what can we do with dna and what can we do with nanoparticles so that's how uh, the whole idea uh, the genesis of the idea came about like just trying to explore things play with multiple materials and let's see what we can do so the first six months of this work have been pure exploration and later we it took us a year to come uh, come about with a solid foundation on what we want to work on so yeah that's pretty much the whole uh, uh, story behind the work thank you and Younes, would you like to add to that give your own perspective uh, yes uh, i my daughter is doing something at the same time so i was only to wonder into that direction Yes, I guess for me, as the learning part, all my degree is in different fields. And after this, I'm moving to Stockholm, where Cesar was before to switch on to a completely new new thing again. Sorry, so let, oh, let, me, let me continue. Yeah, so I was going to say... Here, this is we have a, we hear a lot of children in the background. With our yes, guests. my daughter we is uh, working working on some some stuff over there. <laughs> yeah, sorry, about that. yeah. So I guess for me, I have a degree also in uh, in a chemistry and applied physics and functional materials, and then I was working on DNA on nanoscale on my previous paper, and I wanted to somehow I had an idea of bringing in into more of a macro scale so I can make use of my my degree in materials engineering. And then Cesar came along and then as he said, the whole time, six months was just exploration of what can we do. And this is where we ended up. Hopefully that covers the answer. Yeah, thank you for bringing us up to the present. And, and also I, I wanted to um, mention one more time that how important I hear that your experience with what you call the opportunity to learn through failure, how important that is, and and that um, it's it's just a really it's it's a great great um, attitude to bring to light here in this space because so much of the work is is based on your ability to fr think freely and follow that motivation. And so, if you are able to learn through failure and see failure as an innate part of your work, then I can only see that as a positive, um, a positive aspect driving you forward. So I, I thank you also for for speaking those words here today. Yeah, because I think the people see finished product and they think maybe that's a sour game, but to get to that point, it's just a series of failures, at least in my experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Sesha, you were in mic. Did, did, were you going to respond in there? Oh, well, uh, that's the thing. Uh, I don't, the thing is, uh, for me, the pro, uh, it's all about the process. So uh, in, when you're doing something, you would uh, experience failures or successes. So every failure or every success is a learning experience. So uh, as long as you're not focused on the result, but on the process. So my belief is you will end up with what you want or what you desire. So it's all about the process. And it's all uh, finding that one problem that you are deeply uh, committed to during that period and trying to strategize how you are going to solve that problem. So the strategy and the execution is more important than the final end product. 
I'm writing that down. <laughs> Speaking of profound, yeah, because if you're, yeah, the strategy and the execution are more important than the, the final product because what it sounds like you're saying also is that, that um, the goal may shift. And if you are, are truly in the moment and observing um, what the results are of your work or your research, yeah, then then you're in that moment and then what you what you create will become will become meaningful and and thank you thank you yeah i don't think necessarily yeah. the end product is what you started with because you cannot you cannot predict everything and how the let's say the data how the system will behave you can i don't think it's a good approach to have some sort of idea and try to push everything into that mold but more like see where it takes you what actually comes out of it and adapt to that. Right. Yeah. Then you're ready to see, then you're really doing your research and, and you're really reporting on what, what your, what your true findings are. So at this point, um, you are both welcome to deliver your talk and we have your link pinned up above and depending on your uh, preference, sometimes guests prefer to have a Q and a following, their presentation. Some guests prefer to have the Q and A during the presentation. So we want to make sure that that um, we are facilitating whichever your preference is, so that you have I the best time preference here. Is, preference, I think, is uh, during. I hope it's an informal discussion where people can chime in. Right, Shesha. Yeah. Yeah, uh, let's yeah let's keep it as informal as possible so you can uh, 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 stop us at any moment where we're uh, you know able to follow what we're saying or any questions uh, we're more than happy to answer while the, let's keep it as a conversation I guess mm -hmm. that'll be good for both, all of us. Okay, thank you for letting us know. So having said that, um, when guests who would like, um, viz friends who would like to come up on stage, please flash your mics so that um, we, the moderators, can can call on you and make sure that, that everyone has an opportunity to ask questions of our guests. Um, there's also a room chat and, and we will be um, reading questions that people might put in there who would rather put a question there and not come up on stage. So that's not a responsibility that you need to worry about. We'll take care of that for you. So um, with that, the mic is both of yours. <laughs> thank you very much. Welcome. All right, thank you so much, Victoria. Jonas, uh, I'll... Uh, yes, you can start just... Uh, okay, cool. Uh, you can uh, call my name and... <laughs> yeah, yes. 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 Um, I hope uh, everyone has access to the presentation. Uh, so uh, first thing, uh, the title of our work is uh, uh, called DNA Engineered Hydrogels with Light Adaptive Plasmonic Responses. So that's the title with which we published our work. So I'd like to just uh, talk briefly about the inspiration uh, to this kind of work. It, so it comes from nature. So if you go to the second slide in the introduction, you could find this colorful uh, reptile called uh, chameleon. So the speciality of chameleon is it's got these uh, cells in, the, in its skin. So whenever a chameleon experiences any stimuli, it could be a it could be a prey or it could be a uh, uh, predator or it could be even a changes to the environment that it is surrounded by there are complex temperature changes that's occurring in its body so when these complex temperature changes occur they send these signals to its brain as a result the skin ex the skin expands and contracts so the skin contains the skin cells called iridophores so when the uh, when it is in when there are temperature changes, the skin contracts and expands, and these cells also, uh, as a result, contract and expand. So the distance between these cells changes. As a result, they generate color because these are called photonic crystals. 
they're nothing but photon photonic means light photon here light so the, the way the light interacts with these crystals generates colors based on the temperature changes occurring inside its body so the the colors are dynamic it, it gives a plethora of colors in the visible region both the primary colors like the red green blue as well as the secondary colors like the cyan magenta uh, yellow etc so it's fascinating so the way chameleons adapt to the environment and the uh, environment and the cues that it gets uh, uh, is a fascinating fascinating example of nature where it can generate dynamic colors so here the key word is adaptivity so it adapts to the environment and quickly changes its colors it could be for camouflage it could be for hunting etc etc so this is the big picture this is where we draw our inspiration from how do we generate colors in mat in materials artificial materials inspired by nature that's the whole essence of our work if you go to the third slide uh, i hope you can watch the video play and you can see how chameleon dynamically changes its color it's a short video of 10 seconds or more than that yeah so in the video it's uh, the temperature is being changed for chameleon you could see how rapidly the skin contracts and expands and you can see the colors changing from initial green to a wide range of red yellow etc so this is a live experiment it was it's not our work but it's done by some other group to understand how, what is happening in in these animals so so the underlying uh, uh elements that uh, help uh, or that are functional in the case of chameleon or you have these chromatophores chromatophores chroma means here color so these are color forming elements in the case so that's one of the essential element second the stimulus so what kind of cue you are providing environmental cue you are providing and actuation here actuation indicates how the skin contracts and expands so when you put all these three elements together they form you can term them as a cascade so each one of them have to work in tandem for the chromat for the chameleon to exhibit a color or exhibit multiple colors so oh, we got yeah sorry i was going to say can i ask um how does the cells know which color to actually make like if a chameleon's in an environment like sand or something how does it know to do a kind of sandy color so th that's the, the molecular mechanism is still under investigation but what actually happens is so these cells are uh, spaced at regular intervals so on the skin you have these particular cells they're spaced at regular let's say they're spaced at 10 nanometers and when you see a q it suddenly expands to 20 nanometers so that kind of gives you a change in the visible spectrum the color changes and the molecular mechanism is still under investigation oh. but the, the, so the physical mechanism is well established so you've got these cells on its uh, skin and it expands and contracts voila you got the color but the molecular mechanism is a still a mystery <laughs> cool thank you yeah so yeah so when these elements put together we got we get these cascades so we thought okay let's engineer these cascades in these artificial materials so how do we engineer and what kind of materials we can produce and how do we get colors out of it so uh, our current work so we wanted to we wanted to use light as a stimulus for a uh, few reasons light is a very uh, uh, firstly it's a remote control you can just uh, hold the light you don't have to get in contact you can shine the light from a distance so that's why it's easy to use and you get simple light sources from everywhere from like you can use a normal electric bulb or any light it's very simple and we need to establish 
actuation mechanism so to de establish actuation mechanism you need a skin like material uh, so our skin like material the uh, closest that we can get are uh, materials called hydrogels so hydrogels here simple hydro is water gel is a polymer like i'm sure um, most of us would have used these face packs these gel face packs that people put on their faces for refreshment or for their skin maintenance etc so these are same materials uh, that mimic the skin so that's why we used hydrogels here and why do we need hydrogels to exhibit colors so that's why we use hydrogel here and the most important thing is we need the dynamic features of chameleon how do we get these dynamic features so we use dna strands so yes, sir. do you DNA, want, to, want me to jump in for the application yeah i haven't yet come there Just, all right yeah so dna is quite dynamic uh, in your uh, it's a double helical structure it's got these a t g c bases that's the uh, bases that contain dna and they are uh, very periodically arranged and these dna is quite dynamic it is sensitive to how much salt is present in the body uh, how much salt not in the body but in the vicinity of the uh, gel and it is very sensitive to temperature etc so that's why we need a dynamic components and the third component we if we used is nanoparticles or gold nanoparticles why gold uh, well gold is interesting firstly it's a beautiful uh, metal that you can wear it on your uh, body it's nice it's uh, since the egyptian civilization through the ancient civilizations gold has been a very recurring uh, item that Uh, human beings have used as both as a medicine as well as ornaments but that's as a bulk material but when you reduce the size of gold atom a gold material into nano scale nano scale is like uh 1 million times smaller than your hair like that small gold exhibits interesting colors so it is very important for us to use gold here to generate colors otherwise we wouldn't get the uh, so the gold here generates colors the dna gives the dynamic features and hydrogel provides a skin like environment so when we put this together and we use light as a stimulus we got uh, we managed to get our colors that we showed in the paper um in case if you have any questions i'm happy to answer Um yeah um see the gold when it goes to nano scale then is that um capable of reflecting any of the spectrum like any color um and well, it if it depends on the, like size of the gold nano rods of where would it absorb where would he has this uh, two different absorption peaks so you can tune that completely for example if we're talking about gold nano rods of you know the aspect ratio of it so then you can also tune the peak of if it's happening in the visible range or in the near infrared range so is this like turning the nano rods or something to reflect the correct spectrum to someone who can see it something like that uh, yes like in our case it all it it works as like uh, absorbing our light stimulus so also like the double effect of we can heat it up on its absorption spectra but it's also then depending on so after we change its orientation it depending on like where will they absorb after that with the polarized light what what will it transmit so they act as by themselves but also in nano rods also when they come closer to each other they act together so they act in unison as well That's fascinating. Thank you. Uh Jonas, you can talk about the fabrication. Okay. So, I can bring some 
as Cesha already mentioned about the DNA here and called nanorods. If you're like me at my start of my PhD, I had done like chemistry and all this kind of uh, maybe never really done any biology or anything like this. So DNA for me was a genetic carrier material. And then starting of my PhD, wait, you can synthesize any any DNA you want. Like Cesha mentioned, this four bases, so it's completely programmable. So for our case, we were in our lab and in my previous research for working previously that you can actually put DNA all these gold nanorods. And nowadays DNA has the synthetic DNA's price has come down per base constantly. And it's and these companies that synthesize it, you're able to get any sort of uh, modifications at the end of the DNA. And so what we had is DNA that is modified with this uh, tile modifications at the end that has this uh, coordination chemistry towards the uh, gold, uh, gold, so in this case, gold nanorods. So we can attach them to the gold nanorods. And this, in few years, this way, even during my research in PhD, the way or the whole process of how do we attach this DNA on the gold has like changed completely. That it used to take days or several hours or like whole day of process that you get it. But now what we used here is we just freeze them together. So we have this gold nanorods and DNA hanging in the solution in water and we freeze it. You put it in a freezer for one hour and voila, it's there. And then we hybridize another. So we add another complementary DNA strand that will create this double helical structure of a whole shell of DNA covering the gold nanorods. And this is then functionalized with another group called acridite that will be able to conjugate itself into this polymer matrix that we have chosen here. So we have this completely like synthetic DNA in this uh, very cheap, like I shouldn't say cheap because that makes it sound cheap, but inexpensive uh, building material of this uh, synthetic polymer. So uh, adding them together with this uh, radical initiator, I mean, shine some UV light on it, we can create this hydrocell networks like any shape on any thickness or anywhere we want because we can like in this case remotely control it on it when we shine the uv light on it so just 10 minutes of shining light and we can trap this uh, dynamic gold nano rods into this synthetic polymer network and now we have this completely programmable dna covering in it and we could program it in well in whichever way we wanted but in here we wanted to show like three different DNA duplexes that would show like three different melting temperatures. And also they have completely different mechanical characteristics. And from that completely like different affinity to find these gold nanorods. So the mechanical characteristics of the whole bulk material then is also affected of the cross-linking DNA of the concentration. So the whole process from the starting point of how much DNA will bind on the gold nanorods then will directly affect on the mechanical properties of what kind of gel do we get in the end. So not only we can program of where would this gel have this transient, this temperature that it transforms to one state to another, but also by programming the DNA, we can get what kind of gel do we get at the end. And you can continue, Sessa. And if there's any questions at this point, free free to ask. I have one, um, please. Yes. Um, but when you mentioned mechanical properties, that sounds absolutely fascinating. Um, when you say mechanical properties, what does that mean? Does it, is it like just a shown a different color, or does it mean it can actually? be constructed in a fundamentally different way or, or what, like what for example it's simple of how how soft the gel is like how stretchable it is like we created this ultra stretchable gels that we can stretch them to thousand percent percentage before they break so just 
for example, that. That is amazing. So you could have a, a material then that could become really stretchy, then not really stretchy. Yeah, like it that. becomes like completely soft, for example, that it is difficult to handle, or this becomes that you can just stretch it back and forth and it recovers. That is so cool. Um, is that a little bit like that could make materials like, like clothes that would fit anybody? Like it could, you know, be made flexible, stretch around someone and then be made not flexible once it fits? Yes, yeah, so you can create some sort of a super wet, sticky material or something that is feels like some sort of a stretchable tape, for example. Oof, before I ask too many questions, I'm going to let you continue the talk because that's incredible. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Shesha. You can continue. Yeah. Uh, so, in the next slide after fabrication. I cannot hear you that well anymore. Hello, now? Yes, thank you. Uh, so, in the ne next slide, we uh, after the fabrication, uh, so like I showed in the in the about Kemali on the skin stretches and contracts. So we wanted to first investigate if we by mere stretching we can generate colors. So what we did was we took a piece of hydrogel and we stretched it uh, to various strains. Like it could be it can be it was hundred percent, two hundred percent, three hundred like how much we can stretch. So when we stretched uh, to over 400%, we, uh, as you can see, we can see colors, uh, polarized colors, uh, green and red in uh, this case. So in this case, polarized in the means since, li uh, so light is both waves and particles, right? So you have these light particles moving in random directions the light that we see every day so when you what a polarizer does is it filters light and allows only one particular direction to uh, pass through it so we uh, we used a polarizer in this case to filter a random light into a particular direction light so that it interacts with the nano rod gold nano rod so when the light and the gold nano rod are in the same direction you get a particular color like in this case it's red when the light and the rod are in perpendicular uh, perpendicular direction to each other you get red color in this case so that's how by mere by just stretching the uh, hydrogel we can generate colors Uh, if anybody has any questions, please. That's me again. Um, that's amazing. And um, and you said the control of these rods are what defines what color you actually make them. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And how do you like? How do you control them to the point that you could say this would make this would turn the rods to make red. This would turn the rods to make blue. How do you uh, have that kind of fine control over them? Yeah, so it's a mix of a few things. Like for any uh, material you have to make, like let's say in this case of gold nano rods, you need to start with gold atoms. Like you start with gold atoms and you use chemicals so that these gold atoms come together and there are you can what you can control is initial concentration, how much you're adding gold how much gold you are adding, and how how much time you are letting these rods sit in a uh, tube. So it so by playing with the concentration and the time, you can control what sizes of gold nano rods you are getting, and thereby you can generate the colors you want. Ah, I think I understand. Um, I'll probably have more questions later. No, we'll have more questions later, but please continue. Yeah. Um, um, Aloha, yes, Nicola. Can I also ask a question, please? Absolutely, yeah. Nicola. Thank you so much. I am just stunned about this topic. Um, and thank you so much to be here and share your wisdom and knowledge and research. I am like, it blows my mind and I'm super excited to be here and to learn. Um, my question is, you talk about hydrogel and DNA and all the nice things 
um, have you and you talked about chameleon as well have you ever considered also to take the octopus under the microscope as it has a natural hydrogel on its skin and it's even better than the chameleon with adapting its color and the follow-up question is i heard i don't know if it's true but ginger heads like red heads people with red hair they have right. more more gold in their system which gives them their hair color and the freckles and also like their their stuff but they have not the ability to really absorb color the, the skin is very pale so i was just wondering if yeah. you considered those aspects in your research too thank you so much this is nicola speaking uh uh, thank you, Nicola, for the uh, for those interesting questions. We definitely did read about cephalopods. These are uh, again uh, creatures that are present in oceans and seas that can camouflage and attack their uh, prey, uh, prey and uh, sa uh, and save themselves from getting attacked. So we did uh, study a bit in the sense not we're not really biologists or to bring these uh, um, organisms under the microscope to watch but there is intense research going on in mimicking these features of cephalopods and octopus definitely uh, but the aspect of red hair we haven't really heard this is interesting to know that uh, the shine yeah that, that was something something totally totally new to me yeah i mean yeah it's yeah it's interesting we'll definitely read about it uh, we'll, uh yeah that is yes definitely yeah yeah but like Sasha said yes we i think at least i took some inspiration through all these of of these animals that are able to change their pigments and all that so i think all of them as a unison act as a inspiration here I don't know how about you, but as you mentioned, the chameleon, the octopus also has a much better way to also not change only the color, but the structure of its environment it can adapt to rocks and to corals. So it's not just the color, it's also the um, shape of the skin it adapts. So it can even better merge with its, with its environment. I don't know if it matters in your research with the color scheme, but there's so much we can learn from nature for sure. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom again. <laughs> well, uh, uh, you're right. Like uh, we did start our research in that direction where we wanted to make materials that can even adapt or bend according to the light stimulus we provided. So we initially started with that, but uh, we got to a point we felt that it's too difficult to do this in a short, like the given amount of time we had, but Definitely, octopus is a big inspiration for mechanical engineers uh, to generate or to build these uh, robots called soft robots that can bend, crawl, and jump that kind of uh, uh, objects. So, yeah, thank you. So, uh, if so I may cool. ask, where you're gonna apply those amazing when you crack it and you can use it like for a grander scale where do you want to apply this amazing yeah <laughs> research or stuff you're actually experimenting with i mean where do you see it to be in uh, our yeah <laughs> applied in our daily living well uh it could be uh so since we we work on fundamental research but uh, a couple of things come pop into my head the first thing is it could be used as uh, these uh, display stickers that stickers that you uh, stick onto the walls where you can dynamically change colors like let's say you have something stuck on your window and when the uh, when it's in the morning you have sun hitting the sticker and you get to see particular color when the sun goes down the colors change so these dynamic uh, uh, stickers on the windows, probably that. And the other thing could be uh, just like a, for instance, you, if you change the shape of this gold nanoparticle, you make you can make it uh, uh, sensitive to UV light. Maybe like for people who have a sensitive skin, they can be used as sensors. You can just wrap this around, and when you're exposed, like you would know how much you've been exposed to UV light. So kind of like a sensor with a color patch that kind of application perhaps 
what about clothing and yeah, or, yeah or cars? that's a good idea yeah you can since these are uh, biodegradable materials they can be uh, certainly be incorporated into dynamic clothing where you like switch colors your t-shirts or pants or whatever clothing uh, apparel so yeah have you ever considered temperature into research as well because there's already color you know you have those toys and clothes and stuff which are mood rings right they are changed color by temperature do you do you also apply it in your research yeah, yeah, that's the next part where I talk about uh, how temperature, uh, where we talk about how temperature uh, modulates the color responses. Oh, exciting. And then add on sound, please. Frequency of sound. <laughs> I am I am very, I'm very <laughs> excited. Thank you. <laughs> that sounds exciting sound. I have not used that stimulus before, but maybe it's the next avenue. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so uh, the next part, the next slide is about uh, what we call photothermal energy. Photo is light, thermal is heat, and energy is energy. Yeah. So these gold rods, they can not, they not only generate color, have the ability to uh, generate color, but they also have the ability to uh, take in, get excited when you shine light. As in, they take in the light they absorb all the light energy and they dissipate the taken energy in the form of heat so they are you can call these as uh, uh, small heating rods or heat heat small heaters that uh, nano heaters so when you shine light or when you hit with a source of energy it takes in and releases out heat so since this heat is released in an environment of hydrogel which is water it can heat up the surrounding water or surrounding temperature and surrounding material so the heat generated here can be it depends on the intensity of the light but uh, some reports say that this can go up to even 500 degrees celsius so very potent heat generators and you don't need to use these a lot you can have tiny bits amount and you can heat it to high temperatures do you want to go for the next and two? Uh, the light in action. Light in action and how the adaptive we studied these. Yeah, I will at least go for the light in action. So as uh, Cesar said, we can then program completely of this uh, DNA chance to respond to this heating. And as we have uh, called nanorods that are also synthesized and designed to uh, absorb the light that we want. So these called nanorods that we use were designed to absorb red light. So we could, what we wanted is we could use completely inexpensive materials, the building materials, but also stimulus. You don't need any fancy system here. It's just, you could possibly use just any visible light LED, but in here we use the red light LED, which is at 660 nanometers as is the absorbance peak for these called nanorods. So then we can tune the intensity of light completely remotely, shine it to any spot of the gel we want and heat it up. And you get this, like it hits on the one spot and heats up most in there. And then he has this energy cascade that is, uh, he, heat is uh, moving around the gel at the, at the different pace. So at the center, you get the most heat, but in uh, this uh, circle around, uh, around the spot, you get less and less and heat. So you get different uh, gradient of uh, response here, and then you tune your DNA, and then you get a different, different response from the material from the heating. So as we previously said, the gold nanorods act as the heating element over here, and then the DNA will respond to this heat as they are thermoresponsive. They will have some sort of melting point where 50% 50 of, 50 of them will dissociate from each other. So there's two strands together and they become one strand. And this will affect the overall like mechanical properties of this gel as it goes from this more solid-like to liquid-like transition on certain temperature. So then we can tune by this way of releasing them and then 
they have a they have an ability then or room more when they're not bound to the network so tightly anymore to align themselves better and then when they align they are acting as a unison of then like transmitting different parts of the polarized light and that's where we get these colors and as we have dna which is completely thermoresponsive so when we take away the stimulus and let them cool down and these gels to absorb water from the surroundings we can get back to the starting state so this is we get to we heat it up with the visible light we get to a certain state where we get certain colors and then we recover it and we are at the starting point and this can be cycled so they are completely recoverable there's no waste created or anything degradation happening in the cell Cesar do you want to continue yeah or uh, other questions yeah i mean i'm happy like so Yunus has mostly uh, told, uh, explained very clearly what the system is. So essentially light is here to generate, uh, like Nicola asked, uh, we generate temperature responses in the gel and the temperature responses modifies the material features. Like you have a solid like material first and it slightly becomes liquid because you're heating it up and because it's becoming liquid the rods are the rods can freely swim around and align in the direction in a particular direction since this is a polarized we use polarized light as you see in the adaptive responses slide slide number eight you could see based on the in, uh, temperature we reach we also we can control the intensity of coloration and once we Put it in a humidity chamber these are hydrogels they recover back and we get the colors uh, we get it's no more colorless so we can cycle this system uh, multiple times like you know said most importantly there is no waste and this it is simple light source so these two are the uh, essential highlights of this work yeah uh, any ha happy to answer any questions if in with respect to this uh, these lights, yeah. I'm sorry if this is a really basic question, but you mentioned polarized light and everything, and I'm not as familiar as, with this as I'd like to be, but I read something a while ago about this is how certain sunglasses work. There's like a coating on them, and something like the molecules that are on the lens are a certain shape, yeah? So it only lets some of the spectrum through or as, please correct me if i'm completely wrong here but it's something like that is is this what you're doing to sort of funnel the light that you want to and to reflect off of the gold or am i misunderstanding the process oh no you're spot on jamie you're absolutely right i was about to give the example of sunglasses where there is a small thick thin coating on your glasses and which will allow only certain kind of light to pass through so it will only transmit only certain kind of light. That's why you, when you wear sunglasses, you get that protection from the sun. Like your eyes don't get strained because a lot of the bad part is filtered off. Uh, similarly, in this case, we wanted to test colors in the visible range. So we had to use a polarizer to filter, uh, not in all direct. So we, we let a particular direction of the light to pass through our material so that the, the transmitted colors that we see are uh, the respective red and green colors. So it exactly works on the principle of sunglasses and the polarizers. Yeah. That's amazing. And um, one last question here is, um, <clears throat> if it's using that uh, with that principle, how are you, ch I'm guessing you have to change what light gets in and out um what is doing that uh, uh sorry um, jamie could you please repeat that um, I'm, I'm i'm trying to um i'm trying to think of it in my head but okay so the polarized uh, the polarized like material um it's letting in a certain spectrum of light yeah to reflect off of the gold rods is that correct uh, let's say uh, uh, transmitting it allows transmission of light okay right okay I, I, yeah i need to think about question then before i can ask it again because i'm yeah please continue please continue. uh so uh to summarize uh we're almost at, we are at the end of the slide to summarize what we demonstrated here is something 
uh, lifelike systems. That's the key word here, where life, uh, the inspiration comes from, any inspiration that comes from nature or biology can be termed as lifelike systems, be it on any, or it can be any organism. It can be a single cell organism or it can be a, a multicellular organism like us human beings. So, second thing is uh, dynamic colors. So, we can generate red, green colors now based on the orientation or the polarized response of these gold nano rods. Our efforts right now or in future will be focused towards the getting that elusive blue color into the picture so that we can create, once we get these primary colors, red, green, blue, these can be mixed in specific ratios to generate uh, uh, the secondary colors in uh, of the uh, light spectrum. And... Uh, most importantly, we are uh, looking at uh, making uh, green displays, the so-called green displays, in the sense if the current displays you see in TVs and uh, any screens are contain a, a lot of toxic elements like liquid crystals, which are not biodegradable. But imagine if you can run a whole display uh, based on DNA and hydrogels, they are green and if you once you're not happy with it once it's broken down you can just throw it in the ground throw it and put it in your uh, biodegradable waste basket and they degrade in no time so the whole idea is to push towards green and sustainable display technologies for the future so this work is like this work is uh, like probably the first step in the whole effort and hopefully uh, in our lifetime we would be able to achieve the dream of creating sustainable display technologies. Sasha, oh, my, oh Jamie, sorry, go ahead, Jamie. Oh, no, no, please, you go first. Oh, you're so amazing, Jamie. I just, um, I, I admire your curiosity and your spirit. Thank you. I, I gave you a sweet follow. He's Nicholas speaking. Um, so thank you for being here and thank you, Katerina and all the others to create this room. So Sasha, you just mentioned something about the green light. I am also in a, I'm a light nerd. I'm all about light. And I learned a lot that actually our screens are really bad because of the blue light, especially for the gentleman. It, you know, in the nighttime when you use it, we are used to look at red light to give us a momentum so we can fall asleep. But actually blue light creates a lot of um, estrogen, which for women is not so bad, but for men it's for men, not yeah. so good. So yeah. I, I was I was wondering, as the blue blocks exist and all these things, is this possible that you can create a light which actually filters the blue light in the way in order to make people fall asleep better while actually looking at the screen? Because I have many clients, I work also as a counselor, which have sleep issues and I say, well, it's the blue light, it keeps you active. So ideally wear blue blocks, but ideally three hours before bedtime, don't use any screen time. So I was wondering- Three hours, really? Pardon? <laughs> three hours, really? Yeah, three hours. That... Your body needs three hours away from blue light in order to get into the, to um, produce the hormones, which makes you like want to sleep and rest. So, um, but blue blocks work, but not, of course, not, not a hundred percent. So usually ideally is three hours before bedtime, don't use the screen. So I was wondering if you're working also on it to like filter the, the, the blue light out so people can, you know, look longer. Maybe it's, maybe it's not the ideally thing, but people, you know, be, let's be realistic. Who is not watching anything three hours before bedtime? I don't do it. Um, so yeah, just wondering if there's anything in, in your research too. Well, uh, that's a very, that's an interesting uh, point. We haven't thought about that kind, but it's definitely a direction that we could uh, think about in future. Uh, because, uh, so right now, I all my glasses have this, uh, coating for blue light filtering to when because I work on screens and so uh, it, the coating does help filtering out the blue light but uh, we haven't thought about uh, making any blue light based filters but uh, that's an interesting that's a very good suggestion Nicola thank yeah, you yeah that's an that's an excellent point I mean thought about it
but uh, the whole effort is in this case to first generate uh, colors and control them dynamically and then hopefully fabricate uh, demonstrate uh, uh, active uh, displays that can uh, uh, show these that, that can show these colors uh, uh, yeah I did have that thought before when you said the active um, display thing. I was wondering, I didn't know if this was like too ambitious, but you were talking about, could you have like, like a single sheet of something that could um, continually change to have like a, I don't know, like an entire book's worth of of something put onto this single sheet or something like that? Yeah. Like, you know, like information, diagrams, yeah. things like that. Yeah, potentially. Potentially that's the direction we would like to go where and we can... Uh, make these uh, into single sheet like materials and uh, use electric field use electric like all our displays work on electric electricity so use electricity uh, to generate colors and i just had an amazing thought um because this stuff i was reading your paper as well and it mentions how you can do things like swell material and flatten it out like you said changing the texture and stuff like that yeah yeah um would mm -hmm. this be viable with the single sheet because i'm visually impaired myself so i have to use a lot of accessible um devices to interact with things like graphs and stuff right um could this material be like a, a sheet that's like essentially flat and, and, and clean but you put like sad diagram uh, the picture of a diagram through it and as opposed to showing it through color instead it actually makes it bumpy or raises it so i can actually tactily feel a diagram uh well well there are actually works and people have done in, done using uh, tactile based uh, uh, mechano based uh, materials like for instance uh, uh, when you apply certain pressure on the material you would feel certain kind of response from the material and that's being pursued uh, uh, in the field that we are working on but that's a very important suggestion uh, uh, Jenny uh, where, where I think the the, the uh, beauty of this part is you can tailor these materials to the kind of forces you want so you can tailor these uh, you can generate you can print them you can uh, tune the structure so that a particular user would need certain kind of forces that they apply. Yes, they are. They can be tailorable. That is so incredible. <laughs> that is amazing. Jamie, 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 here's Nicholas speaking. You just, um, as you mentioned, that you are actually visually impaired. And I was asking the question before we went through heat thank you gentlemen for taking us through the heat how it can also um our color but um i am very interested in the sound how acoustic can also acoustic is a frequency right it always has a, um, has a spectrum and i don't know jamie if you ever heard people actually can color has a certain frequency and can be captured so visually impaired people they get some like an implant or something like that so they can get a sense of course um, and see how some people even claim that they can feel the resonance of colors so they can actually dress themselves according to a symphony of colors of depending of what sound they're or frequency they get from the colors by simply sensing it, not seeing it. So I was wondering if your research can expand also in the acoustic and the sound on the sound level. Because that would be so exciting. Like for instance, Jamie. I don't know, Jamie, if you're um, been visually impaired all your life, or does it happen um, later? If I may well, ask. I, I'm happy to reach out to you later, Nicola. I'd love to talk to you about this yes. afterwards, if that's cool. Um, sure. Because I think we've got a lot to talk about. Um, thank you, gentlemen. Nick. Please continue. Well, uh, you, I mean, definitely there are already works there where people use sound waves to uh, dynamically generate and modulate colors because sound is such a clean source and uh, and everyone's got their own range of uh, own frequencies of sounds that one can generate. They're, they are unique, sometimes they can unique and can overlap. So definitely that is also the, uh, these materials are in the, uh, the research is towards making these as personalizable as possible 
to suit one's uh, needs and uh, requirements. And um, also, you mentioned um, you can get the different spectrums. Could this, we already mentioned clothes, and you already mentioned changing colours of clothes, and you also mentioned the visual spectrum. Could it could you actually have ultraviolet? Could you have it where, like, um, you know, like somebody could be wearing um, the kind of clothes that they go to somewhere and, and it reflects on, like, black light or or it shows non-visible so other people with, say, goggles could see you, but nobody else could <laughs> see you because it's dark? Stuff like that? Yes, yes, definitely, because in the, all the individual parts of this whole material are tunable, starting from the nanoparticles, the DNA to the polymer network. So in a, in a case, you could switch the cold nanoparticles to some quantum dots as well, or some other materials. So everything can be like, it's, you can switch all everything around in this whole thing. That could be such an ultimate cool um, camouflage material. Like this will replace camo. Camo is it camo? Yeah, this will replace camo. <laughs> <laughs> and another question here as well is um, when you were talking about the softening and hardening, I'm I'm a little bit like um unsure with uh, this this part when you say um. Okay, I'm 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 thinking what I think about it in my head and tell me where I get get it wrong. Yeah. Um. You say it softens the the material or whatever softens and allows like the gold rods to all join together mm -hmm. in a controlled way. Mm -hmm. Um. How do you then separate these clumps again? Because I'm guessing that you're talking about this is like almost at the atomic level, right? You're putting these um gold rods together. How do you manage to separate them? And it just seems to be such an incredibly fine-tuned thing. Just soften it and put everything together. That makes sense to me. Like any any pot with a bowl of soup can do that. But yeah. Well, uh, so uh, since uh, so it's a hydrogel, so it's it's a polymer with lots of water, right? So when you heat up the uh, when you heat up uh, the gold rod, uh, the surrounding water gets hot super hot like in this case it goes about 80 degrees celsius so what happens is as a result because of the heat the material also kind of melts because of the heat generated but it does not it when i say melting it's local melting that means wherever you put the light on that area melts so when the when the area surrounding the rod melts so Let's say a rod initially is in a solid-like system. It's all completely dense, solid, and the rod doesn't have any uh, uh, room to move around. But when it melts, the rod, uh, when the uh, surrounding area becomes less dense, more liquid-like, the uh, a rod has uh, room to wriggle around. So as a result, uh, the rod orients itself uh, uh, in a direction uh, which gives them strong colors. I hope I answered your question. Uh, yeah, yeah, thank you. That was actually really helpful. And you're even you're even able to control the vibrancy of the color as well. Then, absolutely, you got it. Like, I mean, thank you so much. You found the that part as well. Yeah, absolutely. You get you can color control the intensity as well. Yes, yeah, exactly. That, is so, that can be adapted to like every, this could be adapted to everything that I can think of. This is so mind blowing for me. Yeah. And um, I was also thinking as well, like, um, I, I keep thinking of how it can actually affect, um, like, I keep thinking of clothes actually, um, and how it can do things like um, make, Make him pl places in, on 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 a, on a suit or something more rigid or softer. Like if it could actually work as like sports material and all sorts of things. Could is that is that me just daydreaming here, or could it be expanded to stuff like that? No, no. Yeah, you mean you mean you heat up your body and then you you start sweating and also your 
your clothes get softer? Well, is this the direction you were thinking? I, I, that thing, that thing for sure. But I was more thinking of like you know how when someone goes to do say like American football or something like that, and they could have like a a shirt that hardens to give them a bit more protection, um, but it can soften up afterwards or. Or even um, I don't really want him to go the the military route, but could it be like a like protection against um, a, you know, attack or stuff like that? I don't really want to go down that a particular dark um, tunnel, but you know, could it like more like protective gear that is adaptable to the forces it experiences? Something on those lines? Yeah, something cool like that. Well, uh. Sure, like you can make these uh, materials flexible. I mean, these materials are flexible. Sure, there are opportunities in future where one can generate uh, these kind of protective uh, uh, gears and that are uh, suitable for everybody. Yeah, like like for instance, uh, uh, if you see uh, when we as we age, our skin loses its mechanical properties like when you're young you've got this tight skin but as you grow older your skin becomes loosen up and such in different parts of the body so what happens is these wearable technologies like these apple i watches and fitbits they are not really customizable right they are made for one everybody like they don't really care about how your skin looks or how your skin feels so, but if you make those electronic gadgets with materials like this, and you can clearly adapt them to the nature of the skin, and uh, they're much, they'll be much more comfortable for the user to wear. So, uh, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, that did. Uh, it actually made me even wonder if there was um, such a way of having something like, um, uh, like, like, so if somebody was wearing something like a. Uh, like, like a suit and there could be like a, a button at a certain place in the suit that when you press this button it's actually more like a light emitting diode that it activates like through the suit causing yeah. the, the the light to like change the suit to have more control because oh, because some of the stuff you're describing made me wonder how do you have direct control because i get the reflexive nature of your being outside it gets warmer or it's bright and it does something that's that's awesome but i was also wondering about like the more direct like i want it to be bright red even if it's daytime or nighttime or that kind of thing um if such a sort of internal mechanism could be constructed around something like that well, uh, we haven't given that much thought about it, but, uh, but this session has definitely given us a lot of ideas to ponder about uh, well, and incorporate into our mid, uh, research. So what happens is uh, generally when we uh, start a research project or a piece of work, we don't really look at who the end user is. And most often uh, we generate our own problems that don't exist, and we try to find solutions. But talking, uh, but talking to a diverse group of people really helps to understand what, like that's where you see uh, the companies that make products that people want. They are more successful. Uh, similarly, hopefully, researchers would also adapt that kind of attitude uh, to understand what really people want and focus their research towards that. Yeah, I'm, to... I'm seeing hand gliders, I'm seeing umbrellas, I'm seeing cars with different colors of paint jobs that you can make it well. Yeah. Holy yep. world, I'm making it over <laughs> thank, thank you very much, Dr. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. Jamie, um, I, um, and everybody, thank you so much for the room. I'm going to hop off to my walk on the beach. And I just wanted to let you know, Jamie, as I see you with the guitar in your hand, like a rock star. Imagine, Jamie, that just simply by playing your guitar, there's going to be clothes or T-shirts people can buy from your band. And then those tunes you play, they're going to adjust to the colors of your tunes. And you're going to have like, you know, you yeah, something like that. So thank you so much, yeah. um, everybody. And aloha and amazing room. <laughs>
thank you so much for coming by, Sasha and Jonas and uh, Sasha and Jonas, 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 Jonas. 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 <laughs> and yeah, Jonas, actually, you are a redhead, so you can use your own DNA for the research to see if there's. I'm not fault. redhead. I would say <laughs> um, it's uh, some sort of uh, gravel, gray, brown, no, non-existent color. <laughs> okay, so your your beard looks a bit reddish. All right, you have yeah, my beard is reddish. That is that is true. There, there it gets red. Not on my head. That's a weird combination, isn't it? <laughs> okay, thank you so much, everybody. Aloha. Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming, Nicola. Thank you. Yes, thank my you, pleasure. Nicola. Um, does anybody else have any questions for the doctor here before I hog the stage entirely? Um, yeah, I want to say thank you. Oh, oh go ahead, Katarina. No, no, <laughs> so, so thank you so much, both uh, Jonas and Sasha. That was wonderful work, and we just listened to the question that Jamie and Nicole just asked you. And just, I have a quick question out of my curiosity because we are talking about, I mean, sensitive DNA, and we are assuming it's right, I mean, handed DNA, right? Uh, I'm sorry, uh, I didn't hear the last part clearly. Could you please repeat? Yes, I mean, because we have two types of the DNA and we have a right-handed DNA and another yeah. type of DNA. And we are assuming this is the classical model of the DNA, right? Right, yeah. Yes, right-handed. Also, based upon the concentration that you just uh, talked about, I was just wondering, do we have more concentration around the major group, group of the DNA or, I mean, minor group of the DNA? Did you add this observation? Uh well, uh, uh, to be honest, we didn't really focus on that part. We were uh, more focused on uh, how to get the DNA together onto the gold nanorod, but not really understanding the conformational features of uh, DNA around the rod. Yes, uh, like I previously said, the DNA itself the, what is designed for the sequence, then it will have a different like mechanical structure on how it will bind to the gold. So it, would it be like more rod-like? Would it be like very long string-like? Or would it have some sort of a secondary weird conformation on it going on? So all these effects, but then we hybridize it one-to-one -one with this of, of complementary sequence and we also like this gets a bit more complicated but all those complementary sequences some of them are like one to one the same amount of base pairs so one strand will bind with hybridize with one strand and become this one rod like thingy but in the other sense there's uh, only one part of the strand will hybridize with the other one and there's this uh, dna duplex there that is more rigid and closer to the rod but after that there's this uh, stringy single strand that can float around there more freely if, i don't know where did this go did this answer the question yes uh, i mean i was just curious about the nucleotide and sequence that yes the sequences were well. designed in the mind of uh, thermal responsiveness of where in what temperature they are duplex and what temperature they will melt to single strands to allow for the movement of these gold nanorods in the whole matrix. And what pH you use for? Uh, the pH we use the buffer, so we are in the pH of uh, eight, but which is uh, funny because one of these uh, single strands also has something called I motif that if you would change the pH, it would take the completely different conformation and could change the shape of the gel as well, which is not said anywhere, but I guess someone who knows DNA sequences can see it there. If they look into the paper. Yeah, for sure. I should take a look on the paper. So yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that question, Dr. Shaw, because I actually did forget, uh, I had written down the question to ask you about uh, chirality, actually, because we had a speaker a number of weeks ago who was uh, discussing the chirality of DNA, but it sounds like that's not something that specifically you were looking at with what you were doing. Uh, with 
No, in a, in in a, my previous work and in other works coming out of our lab is we we take all nanorods and we put them on a chiral DNA structures so we get this uh, chiral optical response in the visible light range. So we we are in tune of uh, of chirality of things as well. But this is it's not in this work. Fascinating. And, and one other question that slipped my mind um, is how um, how um, how much would it cost to produce this stuff? Is this going to be like, is the idea of producing something like this with gold atoms, w would it be expensive material or fairly not so? Or, or production, would it be a problem or is there anything like that? No, I think everything is very inexpensive materials, which was kind of the point as well. And also the synthetic DNA production is the prices are going down all the time as we speak since last decade. So everything is uh, very inexpensive. Okay, that sounds absolutely amazing. Um, I'm, I'm struggling not to just send you guys an email with my order list of everything I would like you to make for me. <laughs> but thank you very, very much. This is incredible. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for this amazing talk. And um, um, it's it's really incredible work. Um, so, but, so given that the material probably has to stay, because you said, um, in order to keep the IMOTs um, up, um, they have to stay in a specific pH um, ambient. So it uh, wouldn't be feasible to have them as detectors um, in some body parts. Um, yes, uh, if I can interject there with this, so the IMOTIF is only in, in one of these, uh, like we are showing like range of uh, designs here, we chose three different ones. So that eye motif is only part of the one of the designs of the DNA strand. Oh, so it's not the like the whole material. Like I said, you can program and change everything in this material to your liking. Oh, that's that's really interesting. So uh, do you see like a application of having sensors on the patches? Um, around the body, maybe even in the body, um, that give like a light, um, a color response. Yeah, uh, definitely. And uh, in, in the future, uh, uh, we may not we may not be doing those things, but definitely we see the field uh, going in that direction, developing uh, more uh, wearables or sense more wearable sensors that are uh, tuned to the body, uh, like skin's me individual's mechanical properties. And yeah. Yeah, it's amazing work. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, this was great. And that you answered so patiently all of our questions <laughs> and all of our ideas. And, no worries. Thanks know. a lot for... <laughs> no, thanks this a... has been uh, so much fun, you know, for usual conversations in the lab or even in a conference. I think this is this is more fun. Uh, this is more fun. Thanks a lot, Katerina, for reaching out to us. Yeah, thank you for, you know, coming so fast and... This is such a cool work that, you know, people right away have ideas how they would like to use it and it must be, it must be fun. <laughs> yeah, so maybe, maybe I need to start working on some uh, acoustic things. So sound wave stimulus next. I've been just focusing on light and there's so many ideas with sound. Yes, yeah, sound yep. and what yep. magnetic way, like electromagnetic waves also work. Or... Would yeah, magnet. Definitely. Yeah, magnets. Definitely. Yeah. Interesting. How how can strong I, can I quit? would it need to be? Uh, so you couldn't have an earplug because uh, it's interesting. I listened to um, you know, um, to an article. I think it was Wired, um, where they had earplugs where you can pretty reliably um, measure. A brain activity in the forms of epilepsy, like to predict if uh, an epilepsy, uh, epilepsy um, uh, 
episode is coming up. Mm-hmm. Uh, it would be really interesting to have that also. Maybe the earbuds could change color to just give an additional signal. You know, turn to red. If, sure. You know, something. Do you do you think that electromagnetic fields from the brain or periphery from the neurons would be strong enough to influence the color? Oh, well, maybe the field strengths of uh, of V. But there are certainly uh, efforts in this research area where people are using magnetic fields to generate colors. So uh, let's say uh, it could be useful in the case of uh, uh, maybe injuries to determine injuries around usually we use MRIs and maybe we can along with MRIs, we may not need strong magnets, but in case if you tie it around your knee, if you have some knee fracture, you can use weaker magnetic fields to understand the uh, nature of injury, maybe. Yeah, for example, you know, I don't know if it's that clinical, but um, you have these headbands and so on that right. give you kind of an indication of, for example, if you're relaxing right now or if you are... Um, being, you know, if you are able to meditate right now and so on. Yeah. I think it would be really interesting to have like a color feedback at the, and then try to, you know, breathe in a way that the color goes to blue or whatever and if you're very upset and yeah. right, I don't know. That'd be yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. And I actually have two more questions for you, doctors, and, and then I will... um suspend everything else um one question was where do you see your research going next where are you going from this what's your next goals I'm right really interested to hear. uh so our next goals uh so we want we want to extend this to uh, understand uh to chiral systems like we discussed earlier how we can use chirality to to generate uh colors so the interesting part is when you use chiral structures you can potentially create 3d displays the colors that can be uh, that can give you a depth perception to your eyes that can generate the 3d effect 3d sense so that's our uh, next direction for the in the next one one and a half years oh that is so cool um and yeah. second question <laughs> second question when can you come back to tell us all about this <laughs> <laughs> so whenever whenever Katerina invites us next, so yeah, yes, okay. definitely. So start the timer in six months. Excellent. Thank you so much, Doctor. Thank you both of you. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. This was um, so much fun, and yeah, as I said, I hope you enjoyed it. And come back yeah. anytime you have something you feel like you would like to share with me. Fun yes. to share and, well, uh, thanks yes. for inviting us. This is uh, very, very nice us. to talk to people around the globe. Yeah, so, and this will be recorded. So, um, people, like some people are right now asleep, so they will listen to it later. And, um, yeah, thank All you right. so much again. Enjoy the rest of your evening. And thank you. Uh, thank you for having us. <laughs> thank you for having us. Bye. Bye, thank you. Bye-bye. Good evening to you both, Jan and Crystal. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you. And thank you everyone for coming, asking questions. I know Nicola left now, but um, yeah, thank you so much for all the comments. And uh, Victoria, thank you for sharing uh, in the chat and everyone. And um, yeah, uh, we have our next uh, room uh, tomorrow. let me not say a wrong time. Uh, yeah, follow the club, um, Science Society Club. Um, when you press on the little green house on the top next to the Science Society, you can you can follow and have alerts um, when you um, when we have our next rooms. And um, tomorrow we will have. Dr. Collins uh, talking about um, how to protect the microbiome 
with a synthetic biology um, that will be uh, really interesting. And then on Thursday, we'll have Dr. Otti talking about nonlinear dynamics of two time crystals. We had Dr. Uh, Pedro um, here, uh, the Google um, senior researcher that um, published the first paper about the time crystal. And now we have another group from the UK that um, accomplished to have two time crystals interacting with each other and, and he will update us on, on that work. So um, yeah, it's, um, it will be an interesting discussion. And then on Friday, we will have an early room at 9 a.m. EST about multi-omic rejuvenations of human cells. Um, and then in the evening at 9 p.m. Uh, EST, we have Dr. Atta's um, uh, time machine that studies ancestor galaxies life cycles. Um, so it will be a really interesting universe um, room. So thank you so much. Uh, feel free to come back and um, thank you. A special thanks to you, Jonas and Risha. And bye, everyone. Um, Katarina, thank you. Bye bye. Just, just quickly, I wish I oh, would have yeah. been able to make all of it, but from what I heard, um, if anyone's interested in this and, and the two of you, great presentation. Um, Rainbow gravity theory is uh, very interesting to uh, dig into. Oh, thank you, Kyle, for sharing. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, We'll close the room in three, two, one. Bye, everyone. Thank you, everybody.